Welcome to our webinar tutorial on IRA Vision Basic Concepts. This entry level uh, tutorial will discuss 2D fixed camera robot guidance using the 2D uh, single view vision process in IRA Vision. Our agenda for today will be uh, to go over uh, imaging and lighting, fundamentals, and an overview of the process. I'm going to talk about calibration, about cal the calibration grid frame and camera calibration. We'll get into then the teaching and configuration of the 2D vision process for fixed frame offsets and go into how to program in the teach pendant a actual PIC program using the vision information. We'll test and verify that that works correctly and to talk about briefly handling typical errors that the people run across when using the 2D vision process. And then to conclude, we'll touch upon how to use the found position, which is a variation on getting information out of the 2D vision uh, offset process. Starting right in, our first uh, topic will be, uh, again, an overview and uh, fundamentals review for imaging and lighting. And I realize that many of you have uh, experience in some of these areas. I hope that you can get uh, a little bit of information from this uh, tutorial. If you uh, we do expect that you have a prerequisite knowledge in uh, working with robots, working with robot frames and each pendant programs. But even if you're a, a beginner in all of these areas, I think that you'll be able to learn how to apply, uh, easily apply machine vision uh, guidance with uh, FANUC IR vision. And uh, please feel free to ask questions as we move along. So the IR vision 2D single view process, what does it do? It detects the position of a part and provides a compensation to the robot program for the position of that part in an XY direction and with rotational movement. 2D imaging does not provide a Z axis height, nor does it provide any information on yaw and pitch. We presume when we're using a 2D single view process that for the most part, our parts are in a planar representation perpendicular to the camera and will generally only be in a single plane of reference relative to the camera and relative to the robot frame. The 2D single view process can use either fixed or robot mount cam mounted camera. And for our brief tutorial, we're going to concentrate on the fixed camera, but all the information we provide today can be applied uh, further to the robot mounted camera. And what does the single view uh, vision process provide? It provides either a fixed frame offset or a tool offset. Um, those offsets are relative in the first case to a specified frame, a user frame that you've correctly taught, or a, a, an offset relative to a specified tool. Again, a U tool that has been correctly taught. Let's talk about briefly imaging and lighting. Of course, this topic could be a uh, uh, this could be a topic for an entire webinar series, but I'll just touch upon some of the basics that you have to remember and things that I get asked frequently with respect to image size and resolution. Recall that optics or the lenses are what dictate the image size. The image resolution, on the other hand, is the number of pixels relative to the real world field of view. Let's look at our image over to the side where we see the four features, the four mathematical features of an optical chain in a camera. We have the width of the sensor, which is the CCD width. We have the focal length of the lens, uh, specified by the F number on the lens. We have the standoff distance of the lens. That's the, also called the working distance, the distance from the face of the lens to the part of the features that we're trying to image. And then we have the size of the field of view. As you can see from the, the short, uh, the small uh, mathematical formula uh, by that image, there is a proportional relationship between focal length and CCD width as it relates to standoff distance and field of view. In short, if you know any of those three numbers, you can calculate the other number. Normally we know what so the CCD width is and we know whether we'd like the, uh, a particular standoff distance or a particular field of view. From there, we can calculate exactly the focal length of the lens we will need or the resulting standoff distance of field of view with a certain focal length lens. When it comes to resolution, I have another calculation down at the bottom, and this is even more simple, but I'm asked often, 
how does the lens, the camera, the standoff relate to the resolution? Well, resolution is very uh, simple in, in its concept. There's a pixel size related to the field of view and the camera pixel count. So pixel size in millimeters or inches per pixel it equals the field of view of the uh, overall image in real world core and real world measurements, either horizontal or vertical, over or divided by the camera pixel count, either in the related horizontal or vertical uh, direction. This gives you an idea of the pixel size, or in some some people might even say the pixel resolution or accuracy in real world that the camera is able to achieve. Um, you'll note that. Changing optics doesn't necessarily change the pixel size. The only thing that will change the pixel size is a change of the field of view, as you can see from the calculation, or the change of the camera pixel count. To help with lens selection, use some uh, tools that are available to you. Uh, there are uh, focal length, standoff, field of view spreadsheets uh, available, or ask a panic sales or application in your course. When it comes to lighting, I think you should do what we do here at FANUC with all of our demos, and that is to use dedicated illumination for your application. The use of dedicated illumination can do and can help you in a variety of ways. It improves image quality, and by image quality, I mean contrast and brightness. Uh, we want the image to be bright enough to uh, to extract the required edges or information that we need in our uh, IR vision tools. And when I say contrast, let's, let's be very clear. I'm talking about contrast in the sense of signal to noise. That means we want to make sure that the lighting enhances the image to the point where we see the best ratio of foreground, that being the part that we want to image, versus the background. We want to, uh, we want to highlight the part of interest and low light or uh, ignore the background that may be confusing. Dedicated illumination can also reduce the effect of ambient light. One of the uh, dreaded things in a plant floor is to have a light overhead or sunlight overhead, even worse, uh, that will uh, make your imaging inconsistent uh, over time and over part by part. A de dedicated illumination, if it's uh, bright enough and perhaps even of a correct color, can help reduce the effect of that ambient light. And finally, it helps to ensure the consistency of images. We make part after part after part. These parts change, the positioning changes, what we want to do is have dedicated illumination that will keep that image consistent over time and improve. that helps improve tool performance and promotes consistent tool results, gaining uh, accuracy overall. There are a wide variety of useful illumina illumination sources available. Uh, there's no one rule of thumb, however, to tell you what's going to work for your specific application. It's application dependent, and I highly recommend that you experiment or test uh, lighting sources to see that you get the optimal light for your application. So having said that, here's our setup here in the uh, FANUC conference room as we move forward in our webinar. I'm working with a Sony XC56, which is the standard resolution FANUC camera, uh, using an 8.5 millimeter lens to achieve the field of view that I want at the standoff of about 850 millimeters. I've set up a kind of a broad area LED illuminator Again, this is not to suggest that this is optimal for your application, but it's going to work for our demo. I uh, want to note that we're using a uh, LR Mate 200 ID 4S for our demo, and those of you who are familiar with this might note that it has a uh, force sensor, an FS15IA force sensor on the end. I'll point out, however, that we're not using that as part of the demo, but that's a, a good uh, tool to uh, keep in mind for your applications as well. One other thing I want to say is that we are doing this live. We have the, the robot and the uh, cell, uh, the test bed right here beside me in the uh, conference room, and we will be doing a good portion of this uh, demonstration uh, in live mode with the actual robot and actual imaging. So with that being said, let's move on to, to talk about calibration. And that takes two steps. The manipulation of a calibration grid frame and the ultimate camera calibration. What is calibration and why do we do it? It's the process of mapping real world coordinates to the location of the observed objects in the camera view. Think about it as we look at this uh, grid in the center and the related table over to the right hand side. The calibration plate has a series of dots on it and those are known 
uh, those are actually very precise dots in real world coordinates, known real world coordinates relative to some uh, point on the, on the calibration plate. I've overlaid that just for an example with a grid of what we might think are pixels. And these pixels will be the camera view. Of course, there'll be many more pixels, but those pixels represent the camera view of those dots. When we, when we uh, transform the real world dots to the pixel space, we get a table like you see on the right, where for each dot object, there's an actual coordinate grid position in robot coordinates, and there's an observed pixel position uh, from the camera information. These are used to create a relationship between real world and pixel coordinates so that we can use that mapping later on to find a part anywhere in that field of view and accurately return the correct robot coordinate. What are the steps in calibration for, IR, for the IR Vision 2D vision process? We select an appropriate calibration grid. We want the calibration grid to cover most of the field of view. And even if it covers more, uh, all of the field of view, it, uh, that, can, that can work out too. If it's not covering all of the field of view, however, the areas that are not covered have to be considered as indeterminately calibrated. They'll certainly return a real world point, but we're not, we can't guarantee uh, through the process that those, are, that those points are uh, correctly determined. We position the grid in the field of view. Uh, that's so that later, as, as we do the grid calibration, we can later see the grid in the field of view. And then teach a user frame corresponding to grid points. Again, I'm not going to go into great deal on teaching a user frame, but I advise you to look in uh, your documentation if you're not familiar with that process. And then finally, set up and run an IR vision calibration process. The first step in creating a user frame is to make sure that we have a tool frame pointer when we're doing a manual U-frame uh, teach that is properly trained and active when creating the U-frame. How do we make sure that our pointer is correctly trained and the tool frame is correctly trained for that pointer? I like to confirm that the U-tool is correct by placing a pointer, a, a point, uh, placing it to a point at a known location and then jogging the robot in yaw, pitch, and as we will see here in a moment, in roll, and verifying that that pointer maintains its absolutely correct relationship to the tip of the object that we're pointing to. This confirms that we have a correct pointer, and one of the, one of the ways you can really mess up a calibration is to have an incorrect or incorrectly specified pointer when we're touching up uh, the U-frame for calibration grid. When we create a U-frame for a calibration grid, we have to work with the actual calibration grid on, as a touch-up as touch-up points. As you may know already, there are three-point and four, there's a three-point and a four-point train for a U-frame training method for a U-frame, and there are specific points that must be used in the uh, in the calibrate on the calibration grid for each of these training processes. If we work with a three-point train the orient origin point will be at the center of the large dots in the calibration grid. The y direction point will be the furthest most y uh, point as specified by the two dots, the two large dots in the middle of the grid in the positive y direction. The x or direction point in the U-frame training will be the furthest most x point as signified by the positive x direction indicated by the three main big dots in the calibration grid as well. For a four-point train, it changes slightly. We use the least most point on the calibration grid relative to, those, to that L uh, for the orient origin point, the furthest most x direction point along that line of dots for the x direction point, the furthest most y in the same, uh, in the same manner for the y direction, and the centermost dot becomes the system origin point. So let's look at how we will approach an actual calibration using a grid frame calibrate, a calibration grid frame. First thing we do is, is uh, go through the teach pendant to set up frames and select the user frame uh, that we're going to, uh, that we desire to train as the grid calibration frame. In this case, I've selected user frame five and 
we want to make sure that that tool that we just confirmed earlier is the tool that's selected that we'll be working with as we train the, the grid frame points. We will play, make a comment here. I've called this the grid frame, uh, the grid user frame. And again, verify, even though it's already up at four, uh, uh, four point uh, T method, verify that we're doing a four point user frame uh, teach. From there, we position our cursor at the orient origin point, and we'll start moving our robot now. We're going to jog the robot again making sure that we've selected the uh, tool that's been confirmed and the tool that, we're, that it's related to the actual pointer that we're using. And we'll move that pointer to the uh, orient origin point, which is the least most point relative to the positive x and y direction of the calibration grid. We'll carefully, I'm going to carefully move that pointer so that it's centered directly over the, over the dot. Also making sure that my x, or x direction is right at the surface of the calibration grid. When we have it in place, I'll press record, and that point will re be recorded, and I'll move on to the x direction point. Now, jogging in world coordinate makes this a little easier. We'll move the robot to the x direction point, the furthest most x direction in the positive direction as indicated by those three dots in the middle of the grid. And once again, uh, carefully position that, that uh, pointer over the center of the dot, moving it in Z so it's just touching the calibration plate. And once it's in place, we'll press record, and that will record the X direction point. Moving down to the Y direction then, we'll again jog the robot to the Y direction point, the furthest and most Y direction relative to the orient origin point. and carefully move the pointer again to the centermost uh, point of that dot. And record that position. Finally, we'll repeat this same process with the center large dot on the grid, which is the system in the four point peak. That's the system, orient, uh, system origin point. As we go through this process, I want to point out one more thing. The calibration grid must be at or near the z-axis height of the parts you intend to inspect, the surface of the parts that you intend to inspect. Some error is allowed, but uh, in the type of calibration we'll be doing, it's critical that you get as close as possible to the z-axis height of the target parts. Once that system origin is correct, we'll record it, and you see that the uh, setup frame has been, a new position has been calculated, and all of the points indicate that they are uh, used for, uh, in, used in that uh, user frame. Our next step is to calibrate the camera to the calibration grid. And I'll make one critical point here that you have to put a big circle around and make a big note of. In this type of process, the grid must not be moved from the location you, that we used for the training in that previous step. I find it useful in an application and on the plant floor to actually pin and position that calibration grid in a way that you can remove it and replace it so that it's accurately, uh, accurately manipulated in the case that the camera needs to be recalibrated. That can save you from going through the manual uh, grid frame calibration and touch up should something happen to the camera or the system. So what now we're going to do now is go to our live setup and you can see our robot uh, through our webcam, our IR Vision webcam on the uh, upper right hand side of the screen. And I'm going to bring up 
our IR Vision setup environment. Now, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the IR Vision setup can be accessed from the FANUC robot web server, or from if you're using the R30IB controller, you can also do this process right on the Peach pendant. Um, this is uh, the newest uh, IR Vision setup, and if you have an older version of IR Vision, things will look a little different, but the overall theory will be the same in, in operation. We, as we go into uh, the IR Vision setup, we see that we have a one camera setup tool already present. I've set up this camera in hardware, and we won't go into how we actually uh, have to do that. That's an easy process. You can look at the documentation. What we want to do, though, here is select from V-Type a camera calibrate the camera calibration tools, and we'll create our own camera calibration tool, selecting the grid pattern calibration. We'll name it something uh, useful, and even give it a comment. And with that, we've created a camera calibration tool. Let's edit that camera calibration tool and walk through how we will do our camera calibration. Again, what are we doing here? We're relating the camera field of view to that grid that has just been trained. The robot knows where all the points are. We now want the, cal the camera to know where the points are in its space. Let's snap a picture. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going <laughs> before we snap a picture. We want to uh, do a couple of uh, setup processes here. First of all, we're going to select the application frame. I'm going to use application frame five. Uh, that's arbitrary. That you can use a different application frame, but once you've set it in your calibration, you must use that application frame in your pick process. I'm going to select the camera that we previously set up, which is the Sony One camera, and uh, make sure that our exposure time is adequate to uh, see this uh, see this calibration grid well. Our default of 33.333 milliseconds looks correct for this image. We also it's critical to set the grid spacing for the grid. We know I happen to know that this grid is 30 millimeters. Your grid will be different, and it typically will be listed on the grid what the dot grid spacing is for your specific grid. A few other, cal a few other uh, parameters to be used. We are only going to use a single plane calibration. Again, uh, I, th some of the other types of calibration are for more advanced topics. The calibra calibration grid in our case is fixed to the table, not uh, robot held. And the grid frame, again, the frame that we just taught through our touch-up process is user frame five. For our beginning introdu introduction to uh, 2D robot vision, we're 2D IR vision, we're going to use orthogonal uh, projection on our calibration. This is designed for a single planar representation of our parts where we're not expecting any z-axis variation. If you are expecting some z-axis variation, of course, a 2D process is not going to deliver the z-axis height or yaw or pitch, but it will, uh, a perspective cal calibration can correct for some of those errors in the calibration process. First thing we do then, and it's very uh, simple to proceed, we're going to set the fixture uh, position status. What this does is, through a single click, relates the user frame that we've selected, user frame five, with this camera frame. And then the only thing we need to do next is to train the dots that are found on the grid. So we select the find button, and this is a region of interest. I'm going to manually drag this or position this over the calibration grid. So that the region of interest is just outside of all the dots, yet not touching any extraneous black features that could confuse the uh, find process. I'll click OK, and from there the process will automatically find all of the dots on the grid and correctly order them in reference to the positive X and positive Y axis. We can check this out by looking at the data tab, and we can see that the uh, one, one value in particular that I like to look at is the mean error value, indicating a 0.138 mean error, which is uh, a very good calibration. Anything below 0.5 for most applications is pretty good. And for some applications, even over a pixel can be acceptable. 
We also can look at the points. I want to show you this because it relates well to that uh, table I showed you earlier where we have a vision vertical, a vision horizontal position, and then the real world position of these points, uh, just as we would expect from our uh, grid frame train. From there, we only need to save, and I always remember, I always try to remind everyone to remember to save your uh, tools and your processes as you go through them. That's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen have being made. And we'll end the edit there. And now we have a successfully calibrated robot system with a correctly trained user, uh, user frame and a correctly calibrated camera. Where do we go from here to finish up our process? And you're going to not believe how easy this is. We're going to talk about now a 2D fixed, fixed camera and single view vision process using fixed frame offset. Steps in going forward in this process. In our vision setup, we're going to create a 2D vision process. We'll configure a locate tool, test that location, and then set a reference position. And very important, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then we'll create a TP program to use that process and that offset, teaching the pick point with respect to the reference position, and then test and confirm our overall uh, pick process. Let's once again bring up our live webcam viewer so you can see what we're doing. We'll look at uh, our uh, IR vision setup. And I'm going to remove, now that we're done with this, the calibration grid, showing you one important thing, that the calibration grid is indeed set at approximately the height of the part that I'm going to be uh, working with. I used a, a block to make sure that that calibration grid was at the right height. And the part we're going to to be locating today is a simple machine part, pretty common, something that you actually might pick with the LR Mate. Uh, it's a square, a square machined uh, uh, part, and it has a channel here. The reason we wanted that was because it gives us an opportunity to look at uh, rotation. Uh, so we want to show that the system is going to do not only X, Y coordinate uh, uh, finds, but also rotational finds. To get started, we're going to move our, go in our uh, IR vision setup to vision process tools and create a new 2D single view vision process. Let's call that webinar to, uh, 2D uh, process. And we can give it a comment. And now it's created the process and will edit that process. Starting out with the 2D single view process, uh, again, the familiar IR vision setup screen, we first have to select the camera calibration that we just worked with. And that calibration automatically brings in the Sony camera that we configured. We'll take a quick uh, opportunity to change our exposure time to optimize this process for the part we have in place here. I'm going to make it just a little bit dimmer, but maybe not that dim. And of course, this is uh, some, uh, the exposure time is going to be relative to the type of lighting that you're using. To, configure, to finish configuring the single view vision process, there are a variety of parameters down here. I'm just going to point out the ones appropriate and important to our beginning process. We're first going to make sure we select a fixed frame offset, and again, specify the offset frame, that frame number five that we trained uh, earlier, that is going to be the frame that we put our, uh, re that the vision process puts the results in. And at that point, we have the vision process pre-trained and ready to look at the locator tool. Now, the 2D single view vision process automatically provides you a geometric pattern match as a locator tool. And that's a good locator tool to start with and may be appropriate for many of your easier 2D single view vision processes. I want to point out, however, that IR Vision is very flexible and has a wide variety of locator tools available, blob, CSM, line, and some other uh, combination tools and more advanced tools that you can use to uh, do more advanced applications and more complex location with the single view process. We'll address those hopefully in an, another webinar in the future, but for now, we're going to cancel that and stick with our geometric pattern match as our locator tool. 
Let's go to live, and I have our crosshair in the in the the crosshair that's available in IR Vision by clicking this uh, upper button, and I just want to position that part in an optimal place. This isn't necessary, but it makes I, if I have the part square to the world, I find it makes it easier for me to train and understand where I where I've trained the part. The next step in a GPM uh, locator is to teach the pattern. We go to the teach button in the upper uh, right hand corner, press that. And it comes up with a, another region of interest that we can adjust and place around the object that we're going to search for. We want to make sure that we uh, make that uh, or, uh, that we uh, make that cover the entire object that ha uh, the entire important area of the object. However, without including any or too much uh, confusing background in the scene. Since our scene doesn't have any confusing background, I'm not too worried here. But keep that in mind as you work with your own training. When the ROI is positioned, we're going to click OK. And there we see that the system has trained the critical edges of that uh, part and um, placed the uh, origin in the center of the uh, training area. Now, since I'm not too happy with some of those edges, I'm going to set up a training mask to mask some of the unnecessary edges in the image. And we do that by placing a region of interest in the uh, training, uh, in the uh, uh, edit mask uh, uh, process around the edges that are not, not of interest. And why are they not in uh, interesting? Well, because they might not be consistent over a part-to-part -part basis. These are machining marks that are not going to be consistent part-to-part-to-part. -to -part -to -part. We'll draw that in. And there's one other area I want to mask, and that's this uh, opening, this uh, cutout opening, because that's going to be crucial. The accurate location of that's going to be crucial to finding rotation in this part. We'll draw that, and with that masking, we have a, a very well-trained uh, geometric pattern. The one last thing we can do, if we wish, is set the origin. I'm going to have my pointer point to this hole. It's not necessary that I set that as the origin, but again, for sake of, uh, for, for lack of, to, to eliminate confusion, I'm going to point to that. Uh, Point, uh, point the origin to that hole and use that as my uh, origin. There are a lot of other parameters here, and I'm going to uh, leave that for another webinar and advise you to look at uh, documentation to double check uh, that you know what to do with those parameters in a given situation. But for our purposes now, we're going to do a snap and find and note that the, the, the uh, geometric pattern is being correctly accessed and uh, very accurately found at a 98.8%. Now that we have the pattern trained, let's go back to our single view vision process. There's one more crucial step. Let's do a snap and a find. And the one thing we have to do is set our reference data. What is the reference data? The reference data in an offset, in a fixed frame offset environment is the point at which the fixed frame offset will return a zero offset to our robot program. So when I set this reference data, this now, this origin point now becomes the point that is referenced at zero, zero. And we're going to use that to our advantage when we use the offset in, a, in our teach pendant program. With that, our entire 2D single view vision process is trained and ready to go. I want to remember to save it. And we'll end the edit there and move on to the next step. Here we're going to be creating a TP program and testing and verifying the per performance of our uh, 2D vision process. Here's the PIC program, uh, the TP program for a vision-guided PIC. I have it already in place. Um, and I'll just want to go over it here before we look at it live. We select our U-frame number. This is the same U-frame that I specified in my vision process, and that is a critical, uh, a critical number to use. I specify a U tool or a, U, a tool frame, and this number is not so critical. It, all it requires is that the tool be a, a validly trained tool. It doesn't have to be the same pointer that we used in our, uh, our grid calibration touch up. Uh, it just needs to be a validly trained tool. In this case, this happens to be the uh, world tool, it's the faceplate of the sixth axis. I'll send the robot to a position that's out of the field of view. That makes sense. The robot can't be in front of the part when we take a picture. And then do a vision process, which is called vision run find. And that is going to reference the vision process that we just created. 
our 2D vision process. Then we'll do a vision get offset, which goes to that same vision process after it's found apart and pulls out the offset data relative to that reference position and puts it in vision register of our choice. If that fails, we want to jump to a label. In our case, we're just going to jump and uh, go back to the uh, go back to the beginning. We then uh, go to a trained touched up point uh, relative to the vision offset, and um, that will be our that'll be our uh, pick point. That'll be our uh, our pseudo pick point here, even though we're just going to point it point with a pointer. I've also included. Uh, an approach and a, a depart, which is just uh, accomplished by a tool offset that has a, a 50 millimeter z-axis height difference. Let's go to the real world and see how this is going to work in the real world. Let's bring up our webcam and our teach pendant. And um, since our uh, vision process is already uh, already trained, we'll just look at the runtime vision screen and see what we uh, see what the results are. So the first step, uh, you can see from my tool program, I want to uh, I teach Prendit program. I, I'm, I don't have my vision things in there yet, and I wanted to show you how to edit the, how to insert the vision command. And so I'll uh, pick the appropriate line and go to vision, and the first, uh, the first process is run find. I'll select choice and select the process that we just trained, webinar 2D process. That find is complete. Now let's add in the offset gathering. Once again, going to the vision process and get offset. I want to select the, the uh, 2D uh, vision process that we just configured, and we'll uh, put this uh, information in vision register one. And as we saw in the, t in the sample program, we'll jump to label 500 if that happens to fail, which we hope it doesn't. The first thing we're going to do is step through this program to perform the vision uh, find, and you'll see on the right-hand side of the teach pendant that I have the vision register data uh, showing. And what we want to see here is that the vision register, uh, when we get the offset, since we haven't moved the part at all, we haven't moved the part, that vision register is going to report, when we get the offset right here, it's going to report all zeros. That's an important step, noting that we have not moved the part, so it should be reporting all zeros. Let's go down to our uh, pick position, and we will uh, use uh, we will jog the robot uh, to that pick position, or to where we would like the pick, pick position to be, and touch that point up. Get the get the pointer about in the center of that hole. And that looks pretty close. We'll call that good. And I'm going to use the touch up, shift touch up to touch P2, touch up P2 to the point I've just uh, moved the robot to. We don't want to set a new ID. And because we are at the zero position, I don't want to, I don't need to subtract the vision register from the position on touch up. And neither do we want to subtract the tool offset data from the position, uh, from the position at touch up. So now we have a point uh, trained. Let's manually move away from that. And I'll start the program over in step mode just uh, so we can see it run. The robot will first move out of the way. And we're going to see over on the right hand screen of the vision runtime, we're going to see as we do a run find that uh, data will update. It's not so easy to see because it's in the same place. We'll get the, pro the offset, noting that it still is zero in the vision register to the right. Uh, our pointer will move to an approach position and then down to find the part. We'll depart and move back to the 
starting uh, starting robot position, starting view position. Let's try that now with just a simple offset in translation, X and Y. And we'll run the program in uh, without step mode. And we can see, once again, perfect. That uh, part has gone to the to the position we trained. Let's try it in another uh, XY translation. That's great. Here's the real test. Let's add some rotation to the part and see how the uh, see how the find works. And again, perfect. This is exactly what we want to see. As we uh, as we test as we test and validate our process. While we're looking at that, I have a question that just came in. Uh, the question is, when I go to a vision process, I'm not able to select the crosshairs or zoom in and out on the image. Is there a certain version on IE that I need to be running to be able to see those buttons? I'll tell you what normally causes that. First of all, you do have to be running uh, IE 9. 10 has not been validated and 11 has been tested, but IE 9 is the, is the version that must be run. But there's another, another thing going on there quite often, and that is, you have to set your internet security options to uh, to make the robot IP a trusted site. When the robot IP is not a trusted site, you may get some uh, variation in the uh, in the uh, image on your uh, vision setup screen. Okay, let's continue on. Great success there. We have uh, very quickly uh, created and found uh, created a vision process and very accurately found this part in space. So what happens when something goes wrong? Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's important to know where the errors can happen and where they occur. Typical issues, the most typical error condition is a bad calibration or bad frame definition. Uh, I would say that of the calls I get or the calls we get, this is the most typical error. And it's usually caused by incorrect tool center point selection incorrect tool center point training and that what i mean by that is that you have not correctly trained the uh the tool center point and you have not uh or you have not used the trained center point related to your pointer when you're doing the u-frame configuration or uh incorrect u-frame configuration uh things like going to the wrong point going uh, not matching the points to the uh, to the desired space so this is the major reason we see uh, handling problems. Other possible reasons may be a failure. One big, big one is failure to set or match up the reference position. This happens quite often. That's in the vision process. And to a much, much lesser extent, inconsistent performance from the locate tool that you've selected. It's, uh, th this can happen. But if you, do, uh, uh, if you do your testing correctly, you will uh, likely find that uh, uh, find that it's not a big problem. So let's go go and look at, again, in real world, an example of what we might see when we have a problem with, uh, with the uh, frame or the uh, tool point. I'm not going to take the time to uh, actually uh, retrain my grid, but I'm going to simulate that. The way I'm going to simulate that is to go to the uh, grid frame that, that I taught, and, and in under method and direct entry, again this is grid frame five. I'm going to change these numbers. You, if you, I hope that you can imagine that if I, I change the numbers on the grid frame, that kind of simulates the fact that you were possibly using the wrong TCP for your pointer when you train the grid frame. So let's just put some bad numbers in here, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some odd numbers in here. I'll try 340 and uh, let's just say uh, 30 instead of 38. Now, how do we, how do we reconcile this? So here, here's where we add in real life. Here's where we're at in real life. You have just trained your grid frame and you've trained it wrong. You've done something slightly wrong with that, with that grid frame. Let's say we're, we think we're doing fine and we go through to our, our um, calibration process. We get to this calibration edit and we 
go ahead and set that user frame. I'm not going to redo my calibration. Again, I, I don't want to take time to do all of this, but I'm going to reset the calibration frame to the wrong grid by saying fixture position set. Again, this, this is something you'd be, these are the steps you'd be taking in real life, but you, unbeknownst to yourself, you've mistrained the, um, mistrained the calibration uh, grid. We'll get out of that and go to, again, this, again, following some of the steps we would normally take. We'll get out of that and go to our normal, uh, what we might normally do. We'll position our part in space, just like we were going to train it. We already have our, our um, location tool trained. So we might snap, find that part, think everything is fine, and go over here and set our reference data. So far, so good. It complains because I've already done it, but we'll set our reference data, save that, and go to our teach pendant program and just like we did before let's touch up our let's touch up our um, uh, pick position I'll go back to step mode robots at its uh, offset uh, at its out of view position we're going to run the find there we go it, it found it great we think everything's okay it got an offset that's great thinks that we think everything's okay in fact, we'll go over here and uh, look at that offset. And it, the offset even returned all zero, so we think that's okay too. Um, continuing on to our point, me. continuing on to our point, we will uh, let, let's uh, touch that point up again. This is very typical of what ha happens in real life when you have done the grid frame incorrectly, but you think it looks okay. So I've got the, the point trained again. Let's uh, do our touch up. I don't want to set a new ID. I don't, again, we see zeros there, so I'm not going to subtract vision uh, register from the position, and I will not subtract the tool offset date, of course. So now we have a taut uh, position. Let's go back to the start of our program and try that, that once. We won't move the part this time. We'll see what happens. There we go. Finds it correctly because we've just trained that. And, and surprisingly, not maybe not surprisingly, we can talk about the math, but what does happen is if we just apply X and Y coordinate offsets, it's going to find it correctly again. Here's where the thing uh, really has problems. Because our translation is no longer correct and our transformation is off by a certain number of points, when we rotate the part, this is where we see the error in our grid offset. See how that no, no longer finds the part correctly. So, there is a there is a way to approach this. It's, first of all, the way to the way to recognize this error is by what I've just done, and I think it's important. That step is important to understand that you have an error, and the way you first recognize the error is maybe not when you see the uh, the Cartesian offset in X and Y, but it might be only when you start to try to rotate the part do you see the error in the transformation. So I want to point that out to you. Uh, 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 I point that out to you as a, uh, a common error that happens in the 2D vision process. And the way to fix it, well, what I usually do when I make that mistake is I'll go back to uh, my grid process, make sure I've done everything correctly, trained my uh, tool frame correctly, trained my pointer tool frame correctly, trained my grid frame correctly, and, and repeat the process. However, should you have a bad calibration or a bad uh, or some sort of error in your um, in your system, in your uh, in in the grid frame offset, and you're not in a position to make that change, to make the to make that change, there is a quick way to make a slight adjustment that's going to fix the transformation for you, and that's a Carol program called 
adjust offset. The way the adjust offset works is it takes the, you can specify either a vision register or a position register. We'll specify a vision register. It takes the vision register that we've just received as an offset. It applies it against another arbitrary register, storing the amount of offset, and returns it to us in a new register, a new, a new vision register. Then we use this new vision register instead of the old vision register to, uh, for our vision register offset. Uh, the result of this uh, Carol program is sent to us in uh, register three. If it's not zero, it, it, it has not succeeded at uh, transforming the offset. We won't go into this process right now, but uh, I want to uh, point out to you that this, uh, this is a um, useful way to manipulate your, uh, to manipulate your, uh, uh, an error, a, a minor error in your calibration. Finally, one last word about another way you can use the vision system, uh, the 2D uh, vision process, by uh, not using the offset, but by using the found position. You may note in your teach pendant under look, looking at vision data that the 2D vision process returns both an offset and a found position, and both of those are contained in the selected vision register. That'd be vision register one to 10 that you've selected in your TP program. The offset position we've already defined. The found position is a little, it's pretty easy to understand. It's a position that's relative to, the, it's a real world position that's relative to the specified application frame. So if the part is at zero zero, if it's at if it's at its reference set point, if it's at the excuse me, if it's if the origin of the part's at the zero zero point of the frame, the found position will be zero. If it's ten millimeters x and y from the frame, the position will be x, uh, x and y plus ten. You use it in a different way in the PP program, however. You still run a find and you still do a get offset. However, we will take the found position of that vision register and place it in a temporary position register. From there, we'll still use our tool offset, our tool offset for an approach point, but we'll use the position register as a standard offset to a known point, both for approach and for pick. The thing that's different here is the P2, this point, is only used to adjust the pick position. It is not used as a trained pick point. The trained pick, the pick point is our found register. P2 allows us to train that found register slightly, to adjust that found register slightly to match our TCP. One way to do this is to start with P2, P2 set to zero and with a Z offset that's appropriate for the height of the part, and then later set your WPR as appropriate for the, uh, tool, for the correct tool center point to pick that part using the found position. Experiment with it. I think you'll find it useful in some situations. For the most part, uh, vision offset register is plenty to find the accurate position in a 2D uh, vision process.